everyone. Today we are talking about cultural studies. Now, uh, cultural studies is a broad uh, term to, uh, we're, we're really at the root of it, we're talking about Marxism. Um, so it's all rooted in Marxism, so that's really what we're going to focus on today. In full disclosure, I am not a fan of uh, Marxism in practice. Um, I do think that it is useful in um, in studying certain cultural phenomena. Um, I think it's useful in deciphering certain texts. I think it can be applied to certain texts as an interesting way to understand how uh, power is situated within a text. Um, but there are going to be ways that I am probably more biased than not uh, than, than I usually am uh, in, in other regards with regard to the, the lectures that I post. Um, so it, yeah, it's it's something that we're just going to put out, out out front there. All right. Um, so we're going to talk about cultural studies. All right. And the first thing to know is that when we so for the purpose of our class here. What we're talking about is the way in which a society is organized to create hierarchies of power. All right. Um, so we'll get into more of this as the as the class goes on. But that's really what Marxism as a theor theoretical lens in the field of communication. That's really what it's interested in is how does this text create a power system or reinforce a power system or uh, counteract a power system, resist a power system. It's all about the ways in which text, so it could be, you know, words on the page, a speech, uh, t television programming, right, uh, movies. How do these, how do these massive cultural narratives, cultural texts, how do they create power hierarchies, um, resist power hierarchies, try to tell different stories, et cetera, right? But it's all about, there is a power hierarchy, and we can either sort of fall in line and tell the sort of same uh, hegemonic story, um, or we can resist the current power hierarchy created by the text and tell new and different sort of counter stories. All right. Um, just a little FYI history info here. Uh, this is a pretty well known uh, poster piece of propaganda that's been, um, it's a couple different ways you've probably seen something like this with different figures on it. Um, but just so you know, uh, to the far left over here, this is Karl Marx, all right, Marxism, right? This is Engels, who was a friend of his, who helped him put some stuff together. They also have this really interesting relationship with regard to the funding of their project. Um, Engels' dad was, uh, you know, owned um, part of a cotton mill and other sort of textile factories. So Marx and Engels uh, got the support to write their um ridiculous ideas uh, through, you know, large capitalist enterprises. Um, this is Lenin, who was uh, the first to take over uh, the USSR after the revolution in the early 1900s. Um, he, he's the one who moved the capital from the, uh, uh, the sort of aristocracy at St. Petersburg. He moved it down into Moscow. So uh, the USSR, sort of the genesis of it, Lenin was the first leader of that. Then Stalin took over from Lenin, so also in Russia, uh, leader of the USSR. Stalin was a tyrant. Um, Lenin was probably, you know, you talk to people who have a more of a, of a Russian background than I do. The way that I have seen it is uh, Lenin is still celebrated in, in Russia, where Stalin is not. Um, Lenin was more of an idealist, uh, thought that he could get these sort of utopian ideas to work. Uh, Stalin really ran with it and was more tyrannical when you talk, start talking about things like putting people in the gulags, sort of like the mass genocide uh, that was going on of, of his own people uh, in Russia. That was mostly under all, that was mostly under Stalin. Um, and then this is Mao of, of China, who was also uh, sort of, if you ever heard of like the cultural revolution in China or Maoism, um, this is the individual who was in charge of it, right? Um, the big thing that sort of connects all these individuals is they are, were all influenced by, by Karl Marx's ideas. Uh, but one of the sort of problems and the limitations of, of Marxism in general is once you put this sort of like Marxist utopian story on paper, like what do I want my society to look like? What ends up happening, especially when you are dealing with 
tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people is anytime someone sort of gets out of line, um, they either go to the gulags, right? You throw them into, you know, prison re-education camps. Um, these are actual real things, right? Um, and what now we sort of use them as a pejorative, but you know, these were real things that like people got sent out. Like if you spoke out against a sort of utopian vision of the leader, um, you would be disappeared. Um, and the other thing is, you know, it, it quickly leads to fascism. Um, fascism is the uh, government sponsored censorship. All right. So sometimes we use the word fascism or fascistic uh, to talk about censorship, for instance. Um, but fascism as a, as a sort of on the ground policy is, is, is state backed, government backed censorship. So for instance, if, you know, the, the, the people in charge of the government has this, have a utopian idea for how the government, uh, or the, the community, the society, whatever is supposed to be ran. If I want to write a book that is counter to that, um, the government steps in and sort of censors my book, like free speech isn't allowed because anything that would challenge the narrative of this utopian vision for, you know, peace and prosperity at the end of the road, um, you have to squash those ideas. All right. Uh, so there isn't this sort of like free and open society, uh, because again, you're trying to keep, let's say 100 million people in line, right? If you start allowing dissenting voices in the conversation, like, you know, life is chaotic. Um, and, you know, if, if you want to set up a utopian vision for the world, it's like you got to keep people in line and, um, you know, yeah, censorship, fascism, like that's the way to, that's the way to do it. All right. Um, so just know who these individuals are for the, <laughs> for like being an educated, you know, worldly scholar. Okay. Uh, some definitions. This is out of the, the textbook uh, that I used to use for the class, right? Um, so as far as cultural studies, right, the, this is really about the media, right? So again, the text that we produce in the media. The media represent ideologies of the dominant class in society because the media are controlled by corporations, quote, the elite, right? The information presented to the public is consequentially influenced and targeted with a profit in mind. The media is influenced and the role of power must be taken into consideration when interpreting a culture. Now, I think this is all factual, all right? So I do think that Marxism as a theory has a place in um, deconstructing culture and looking at culture and looking specifically at sort of the elites that are in charge of culture, right? I think this is all valid, right? Um, Marxism as some sort of government means of sort of setting up a society or an economic system, I think is horrifying uh, when you're talking about implementing it to, you know, millions of people again, right? And we'll talk more about that near the end. But as far as like this, this Marxist theoretical concept that people in elite positions of power use large scale media as a way to control the narrative and therefore sort of control and shape the behavior of the proletariat, right? So this is Marx's idea. The proletariat is sort of the masses and the bourgeoisie are this small group of individuals at the top who, you know, are the puppet masters. They control everybody. I think that is 100% accurate, right? If I am in charge of a large um, profit driven corporation, I'm going to do everything I can to keep my consumer base. All right. Um, so here's a quick YouTube video that is specific about the music industry. Um, it's, I think it's called money for nothing. Um, it's a larger sort of like hour long documentary, but this is like a five minute sort of consent, uh, concise representation of the entire film. And, and it does a really good job explaining how most of the media is just owned by a handful of corporations. All right. Um, and when you start to realize this, what you start to realize is a lot of the sort of, um, yeah, it's not really the sort of like, you know, open and free market when you talk about, you know, everyone can be involved. It's like, no, like you got to know the kingmakers, right? You have to have access to these like corporate boardrooms that are very isolated. Uh, they don't allow a lot of outside influence. Um, and yeah, if, if they get to control what you see on TV, it's like they get to tell you whatever story they want. If you have a movie idea, but you got to go through, you know, Warner Brothers or MGM or, or uh, 20, uh, 20th Century Fox, it's like it's, it's very, very hard to get things onto Netflix or in the cinema unless you know this small group of individuals at the top. And those small group of individuals have an interest in perpetuating a narrative to keep all of us consuming and to keep them in their, you know, nice, fancy houses, right? So this is what, you know, you start cultural studies is looking at, right? Like when I look at the media, 
I always look at it with this critical eye of they're probably trying to tell me a story in a way so that they can continue to earn profits and be powerful and sort of keep everybody else just kind of consuming, you know, comfortable. Like we want to keep you comfortable enough so you don't rise up and have a revolution, but we don't want to give you so much power that like you could challenge us for, you know, yeah, you know, our, our role at the, at, in the boardroom. All right. So that's what cultural studies is looking at is how do the people who get to tell the stories or have access to telling the stories, um, how do they just kind of keep all of us consuming and how do they tell stories uh, that will satiate us, but also at the same time, like keep them powerful and, and making profits. All right. So there's manipulation involved. All right. And over here, I have some examples of this. Uh, some of this is just from the last couple of years. These are the things I always sort of just look at and I'm probably more cynical than most. Um, but when I see large corporations putting out these sort of like major social justice statements um, for whatever the cause is, I'm always like, yeah, you, you, you know that by putting out, you know, a black square last summer, for instance, on Instagram, like you're doing that, like maybe you support the cause, but you're probably just doing that because it's going to kind of shore up your consumer base and it's going to make you look good and like people are going to buy your product more, right? So there's a couple examples of this. Uh, ben and Jerry's ice cream, they, you know, have created, a, they did a lot of Black Lives Matter stuff last summer. Um, this is a uh, ice cream flavor called Resist, I suppose. Uh, at least it's on an ice cream container. I'm not sure if you know, this was an actual ice cream flavor or not. But Ben and Jerry's was very active, right? So you look at this and it's like, okay, that's cool. Like your tiny little pint of ice cream also cost me like $5. Um, and so let's not get it twisted and act like as if, you know, Ben and Jerry um, are making these like large uh, corporate sacrifices uh, to put out a statement that everybody is agreeing with, or at least a large consumer base is agreeing with. And my guess is that Bear, Ben and Jerry's is selling more ice cream in the last year because they sort of get onto this, uh, whatever, whatever sort of uh, narrative bandwagon. Um, you know, sloganeering people are sort of shouting. Um, this is pretty popular now uh, during like Gay Pride Month, which is in the summer. Um, a lot, you know, big corporations will put out, you know, uh, sort of uh, pride in, uh, inspired clothing, um, which I think is fine. I think that's great. Um, I think it's 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 good when when large corporations get on board with uh, various um, uh, issues regarding like equality and inclusion. But also, like, let's not be so naive to think that, you know, they're being radical and supporting ideas. Um, like, they're selling, like, at the end of the day, it's like they're selling T-shirts. And, and they're selling a lot of T-shirts, and they sort of get on board with um, whatever message the masses want to hear. And at the end of the day, it's like the, the CEO of, uh, of Gap is still making a lot of money at the expense of uh, everyone who's buying those shirts. Um, Jay-Z up here, he got a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, flack for this. Uh, about 10 years ago when Occupy Wall Street um, was sort of setting up in Zuccotti Park in New York, um, Jay-Z came out and was like, I support you. And it's like, you're worth a billion dollars. Like, like, okay, like, I'm glad you support Occupy Wall Street, but also like, I think there's some cognitive dissonance going on. Um, and he started, he created a clothing line out of Occupy Wall Street. And as you see, like, this is Jay-Z's actual shirt that he was selling. And it was Occupy All Streets, right? So he was like, we're going to be a revolutionary, whatever. And it's like, you're also with a billion dollars. Like, you, you're the one who has the influence um, to change these things. And, like, clearly you're not using whatever influence you have. Like, you're selling shirts, right? You are selling a message to the masses. You're making more money. So you're staying at the top because you're satiating the masses. Um, so there you have it. And then finally, this is uh, Nike. Uh, a couple years ago, Nike did this whole thing with Colin Kaepernick. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, Ka Colin Kaepernick is super uh, controversial. Um, I actually just wrote a paper on this uh, specific situation with Nike and Colin Kaepernick. Uh, Nike, Nike's profits and their stock went through the roof. All right. So anytime you see corporations putting out these like new narratives, it's like, is it really costing them anything? Um, some people might say that publicly they they'll say something to the effect of you know we are going to put out this statement and, and we don't care if it makes us lose money and it's like you do care and you've never lost money you know sort of glomming onto a cause that everybody is already supportive of right everybody was saying black lives matter last summer as far as far as corporations were concerned because 
it was extremely popular. Um, ergo, it was going to be extremely profitable, right? So that's what we're looking at in cultural studies. What story, like the people who are, who have the influence with regard to storytelling, movies, television, corporations, who control the larger corporate narratives, um, what narratives are they telling? And they're usually telling narratives that are going to make them more profitable. Um, most corporations don't sort of stand up on principle, uh, principles that are unpopular, let's say. Um, their corporations are usually kind of behind the pack to say, okay, what does everybody like right now? Okay, now we're gonna come out and support, you know, uh, Gay Pride Month. Okay, now we're gonna come out and support, you know, Colin Kaepernick. Once we did our research, Nike did the research, they're like, okay, we're gonna support him now. <laughs> um, so that's what cultural studies is looking at. Uh, go ahead and watch this uh, YouTube video. It'll give you some more information on the music industry and how the music industry is, like pop music is, it's all just, um, it's not as, it's, it's just kind of all made up. Um, it, it, I mean, these, these are real songs that we listen to, uh, but it's far more uh, controlled um, than, than what you might think. All right, there's this guy named Gromsky, um, and he talks about this idea of hegemony. And what hegemony means is the domination of one group over another group, usually with regard to influence, leadership, and values. So what Gromsky's talking about is um, uh, domination by consent, right? So if a, if a corporation or if someone gets, wants to get control over me, right, they can do it in one of two ways. They can either force me, right, like at, you know, at the threat of violence, right, or they domination by consent is like they they give me a little bit and then i just kind of give them everything so you could think about um like google or amazon uh i don't really want to be tracked i i like my privacy but i also really like the convenience of like going on google and all of my favorite things popping up on the web right um it's like twitter's for free facebook is for free uh but it's like no you're giving them your information right so facebook twitter google amazon they do control us in regards, right? Like you shop for one thing on Amazon and then you have like 50 pop-up ads for like the next thing you should buy. So I'm giving up my personal information to let's say these corporations, um, but I'm doing it willingly. Like nobody's forcing me to shop on Amazon, but I do it because I like the convenience and me liking the convenience means that I'm gonna shop at Amazon more. So Amazon sort of gets to control my shopping habits more, right? So that's what Gromsky is talking about, domination by consent. I am, give, I, I am voluntarily engaging with these corporations, um, but in exchange, uh, you know, they, they get access to a lot of my information, right? Um, and if I stop and think about it for a while, I'm like, you know, is me giving, like, is, is, you know, me giving up all of my private information, is it really worth uh, these individuals having that much power and control over me? And some people are going to say, yeah, some people are like, yeah, I, I like the fact that Netflix recommends me new movies based on the movies I already watch. I, I like the fact that, you know, Amazon can kind of basically do my shopping for me because I've shopped on them so much and they just predict my behavior. Um, and some people get a little bit more, you know, uh, a little bit leery of that. I'm one of those people. I'm like, I don't really like this. All right. All right. Um, false consciousness. People are usually unaware of how their lives are being shaped uh, by those um, who have more power than, uh, excuse me. Yeah. They have more power than them. So we usually like to think of ourselves as like, I'm an individual, right? But then when we think about it, it's like, well, I act in, like if I'm acting and I'm behaving like everybody else around me to fit in with like, fit in with the trends or the cool kids, um, am I really an individual? And the answer is no. It's like, where do you shop? It's like, I shop on Amazon like everybody else, right? Um, I wear, you know, brands that everybody else wears, right? I dress in a way that everybody else dresses. I, 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 am, I, I watch all the TV shows that everybody else is watching, right? It's like, what's the cool Netflix show? It's like, there's endless option on Netflix. And it's like, everybody's watching the same shows on Netflix um, or Hulu or Amazon Prime or whatever it is you have, right? So people act like people want to think that they're acting individually, but there are these very carefully crafted ways, especially in the age of the internet and social media, where all these media companies are sort of like constantly leading us to the same web page. They're leading us to the same results. Netflix is all leading us to the same movie, right? Or television show or what have you. Um, and so that's what false consciousness is, uh, is that we are, we, we, we are being manipulated, right? Myself included, right? I'm not a, like, I'm not absent of this, right? Um, we all are being manipulated, uh, by larger stories, uh, by a larger, with people with larger influence, 
Um, we like to act like we're not, but but we are. Um, some of this happens on like Instagram uh, with like celebrity influencers, for instance. Um, you know, you see like a, a, a post, I don't know, like Kim Kardashian, you know, shows up wearing a certain kind of shoes. She doesn't really say go buy the shoes, but everyone sees her shoes, you know, at some premiere and then everyone goes and buys those shoes. It's like those shoes were carefully placed in a Kim Kardashian post. Um, you know, and the same is true with lots of other ways in which celebrities don't outwardly say like, this is a commercial for this product, but you see a celebrity kind of wearing a product, a watch, a necklace, a hat, you know, a brand, and then everyone's like, oh, I'm going to go buy all that stuff. Um, you don't really know that it's happening, but it's happening. All right. Counter uh, hegemony, right? Counter hegemonic practices, right? Is, is when people who are currently marginalized or groups that are marginalized, they use hegemonic tactics to change systems or beliefs, right? Now, two good examples of this. I know the Cosby show, it has a different meaning now, but go with me here. The Cosby show was a show in the 80s, right? With Bill Cosby, who obviously has some problems now, right? But it was a way in which um, individuals who were on the Cosby show used the power of the media to change perspectives about African-Americans and African-American families in the larger cultural narratives, right? So prior to this, you know, most of the representation of black families on TV was, um, uh, was um, sort of like lower working class, um, you know, like a show like Good Times, right? It's, it's sort of like, you know, people, you know, struggling along, sort of on the fringe of society. The Cosby Show was like a show about like a doctor and a lawyer who had kids and race wasn't discussed as much on the show, just sort of like, but people obviously knew that the family was black because they're watching them on TV, right? So the Cosby Show used these sort of hegemonic means, the, te the television, to create these, narr to create a counter narrative for what Africa, how African Americans were being portrayed in the media prior to this. Same is true with the show Ellen, which I've talked about in some other classes. Um, Ellen had her own TV show before she was a talk show host. Everybody knows Ellen as a talk show host now, but she actually had a, her own sitcom. And her sitcom, like near the end of her sitcom, is when she uh, came out as gay on the show after the sitcom had been on TV for a few years. And this was in the 90s when uh, uh, people being gay was not well accepted. Um, it, was, it was, I mean, there was ways in which it was like very much frowned upon very openly. Like it was not this very accepted thing. Um, so Ellen, everybody loved Ellen as a comedian. She had her own sitcom show and sort of by the end of her sitcom, finally, when it's like Ellen comes out and is like, and I'm gay, um, there's a way in which a lot of the audience was just, you know, probably confused about their own feelings with this, right? Because it's, if most of the audience in the United States was like against uh, homosexuality, now the audience has to reconcile the fact it's like, but I really like Ellen. Um, so this was a huge shift, right? So using hegemonic tactics, television narratives uh, to sort of change views, change beliefs, change behaviors. All right, um, one of the things that is sort of like a limitation uh, with this is, is this idea, like, People want to go in and they say things like, uh, the media is in charge, the media influence, um, you know, Walmart is controlling us. Those are only a small group of individuals at the top, right? There needs to be a recognition that consumers also control the media, right? Um, they, they, make, they make certain stories and certain TV shows because we watch them. And if we didn't watch those things, like we actually have more power in controlling larger media narratives than like we, the masses, the proletariat want to admit, all right? So when you go around and people say like the corporations, the corporations, the corporations, like, well, they exist because you buy from them. All right. So it's always like a second half of the equation that isn't talked about as much um, uh, within Marxism. All right. So, you know, if you're a person who's like really upset that the Kardashians and reality TV is everywhere, it's like, well, you know, have you ever turned on C-SPAN? And it's like, you know, most people are like, no, I still watch all the re reality TV. It's like, well, if you're upset that there's garbage on TV, it's like, you got to make different choices uh, to get the garbage off TV. Like if the Kardashians was not profitable, people wouldn't make it, right? If C-SPAN was super profitable, you know, they'd put it on a major network, right? They would put lots more money behind it, right? But they don't. Um, we can see this happen every political season when people say something to the effect of, you know, we don't like negative political ads. Negative political ads are all over my TV. But the reason that people keep using them is because they work. Um, 
This is just like a, this is a fake one, right? But somebody made this. This is Roy, uh, Roy Blunt. He's a senator from Missouri. He's actually about to retire, I think, like a week or two ago. He announced he's not going to re- run for re-election. I mean, he's been there forever, so it's not a big surprise, right? Um, but yeah, killed the last unicorn, right? Plunge us into a world of darkness. Um, we respond to negative political ads because they work. Everybody keeps saying that they hate them, but then when they do research about what ads were effective, a lot of people who vote, they don't necessarily go and vote for their candidate. They go and they vote against the other person. Uh, we saw this, you know, in like 2016, for instance, was a big one. Nobody really was like, like in mass, like nobody was super, super excited about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. Most people were like, Hillary Clinton can't be president. I got to vote for the other person. A lot of people were like, Donald Trump can't be president. I'm going to vote for the other person, right? Um, you know, similar results have come out in like 2020. Like there weren't a lot of people who were actively voting for Joe Biden. A lot of people came out because they were like, I don't want Trump in office anymore. This is ridiculous. So they had this huge turnout for Biden. Um, and a lot of it was because, you know, people were just like, didn't want Trump in office anymore, right? So the negativity uh, can drive consumer behavior. So when we say, I don't like negativity, the fact of the matter is a, is a lot of us are driven by, uh, to, to, are, a lot of us are compelled to act because of the threat of, um, uh, of negativity. All right, some more assumptions here. Um, I love this quote by Alice Walker, where she says the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any. So again, if you go around and say like the corporations are, you know, controlling everything, uh, well, it's like you have some agency, like you can choose where to shop. Like you don't have to shop on Amazon if you don't like them. You don't have to shop at Walmart if you don't like it, right? Um, culture pervades and invades all facets of human behavior, right? So all the ways in which we act are influenced by culture, right? Uh, and you just need to be more insightful with regard to how your own behaviors are being shaped. And if you start to have an understanding about how your behaviors are being shaped, then you can sort of reverse engineer that and figure out new ways or new media to come into your life to shape your behavior, right? If you're really up, you know, upset with like the television choices uh, that are on TV, it's like, well, you got to change the channel. If you're really upset about, you know, the books being published, it's like, you, then you got to support and read different books. Um, if you're really upset that all your mom and pop stores in your in your neighborhood are closing and Amazon's taking over the world, you know, it's like, you got to stop shopping on Amazon and go shop at your mom and pop stores, right? Even if it's going to be a little bit more expensive, okay? So um, people are a part of a hierarchy, uh, excuse me, people are part of a hierarchical structure of power. Some people do have more power than others, but we all have some power, all right? So this Alice Walker quote over here. Right. Um, so when Marxism does divide it between like the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, it usually not all the time, but it usually is talked in this way of like these rich people are in charge of everybody. And, you know, we need to have a revolution because we don't have any power otherwise. And I don't think that's entirely true. I think that a lot of people have power right now and that they don't actively use. They think the only way in which they can get power is by having some huge revolution. Um, as opposed to saying, no, there, there are small ways in which I can have uh, influence in culture right now. I can choose where I spend my money. For instance, I can choose how I use my time. I can choose what you know text I consume, whether it's books or TV or movies or what have you. Right. So you actually, I can choose what websites I go on to, search engines. If you don't like Google tracking you all the time, right? It's like you know use Bing or Yahoo or uh, there's something called like DuckDuckGo, I think. All right. There's all these like weird little like. They're marginalized, right? They're very, very small, but there's different search engines you can use. Uh, if you don't like Amazon, shop somewhere else, all right? So you do have more power than you think, but a lot of people sort of fall back on like, but it's too hard. It, like it's it's very hard work to go and do things that aren't convenient. It's like, well, yeah, right? It is hard. Like it's hard to shop online anywhere else but Amazon. It's hard to use any other search um, search system except for Google. But if you want these things to change, it's like these are some you know, decisions you got to make, right? Okay. Um, we all have the ability to limit other people's power. Again, I have the ability to, you know, limit Walmart's power because I don't shop at Walmart, right? This is the decision I made way back in undergrad. Um, I didn't like the way in which they were. This is when Walmart started like really getting on board with like building like the Walmart superstores. Um, these like huge Walmart superstores didn't really exist. There was this huge boom in like the late nineties, early two thousands. Um, where Walmart started like making these huge superstores everywhere, and I hated it uh, for lots of reasons. Um, so I was just like, I'm just not going to shop there because this is not the way in which I want. <laughs> this is not the future that I want for my for my town or my community or for my own shopping habits. All right. 
Um, if you don't like all the sex and violence on TV, it's like, well, then don't watch those TV shows, right? Like, make commitments to yourself with regard to what it is you want to see on TV, what you don't want to see on TV, and watch the things that you want to see, right? If you watch things, those people in charge of making those stories are going to make more of it, all right? Same thing with, like, music. Um, there's some controversy, I guess, at the Grammys, like anybody watches the Grammys anymore, but they did the um, uh, Cardi B and Megan the Stallion did their dance to their uh, explicit song. We'll say I'm not even gonna I'm not even gonna name the song uh, for fear of retribution. Um, and people were upset about it, right? And my whole thing is like, I mean, you can be upset about it, but also it's like, you know, are 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 have you have you watched the YouTube video? Have you do you know the song? Do you know the lyrics to the song? If you don't want that type of music pervasive in culture or on display at the Grammys, it's like you got to consume other music. Like you have to get your friends to consume other music, right? You have to recommend music for your friends to, to listen to that isn't, you know, um, this specific Cardi B song, right? Plenty of Cardi B songs are fine. Um, this, like this one, you know, specifically uh, might have been a little over the top for like prime time at the Grammys on like a Sunday night. Um, however, you, you do have power to, to change things based on what you will, uh, what you choose to watch and what you choose not to watch. Okay, so let's talk about Marxism here. All right, here's two videos I need you to watch. One is 10 minutes long. The other one's like two minutes long. Um, but they both do a pretty good job giving you some information on Marxism. There's like a million videos on YouTube that can give you different understandings of Marxism. Depending on what video you click on, some people are going to say Marxism's great. Some are going to say Marxism's terrible. Some people are going to try to be a little bit more neutral on it. Um, but they do a pretty good job, uh, these two videos. Um, so check them out. All right, I'll put them down below. All right. The big thing that you need to know about Marxism is it's focused on classism. And this is going to be important because the next slide is going to show the ways in which Marxism influences things beyond class. All right. So Karl Marx. So watch the videos for more details. But briefly, um, Karl Marx was concerned about class divisions as far as what are the economic in underpinnings of creating a society and those economic underpinnings drive the rest of culture. That's, this is Marx's idea, right? So if you have a capitalist culture, um, what Marx found uh, is that you have the, the people at the top, the bourgeoisie, the people who are the stakeholders, who the, the, the stock, you know, the, the stockholders, the CEOs of companies, they control everything. And then you have the proletariat who are all the workers, all right? And Karl Marx, was you know his his idea was like all these workers are not making as much as the ceos why not so he thought that the all the workers should have um just as should should earn just as much profit for the selling of goods as the ceo and the upper management etc all right so if you have a factory that makes a bunch of let's say uh typewriters right and then they're selling all these typewriters it's like why aren't the like? Why does the CEO get to keep the majority of the money, and everybody down here is making like you know minimum wage or fifteen bucks an hour or whatever it might be, right? So Marx was very very concerned about this. Was concerned about this sort of class divide between people at the top of the company and people who were running or people who were uh, putting the stuff together in the company, right? The other thing is that you know all these sort of like worker bees at the bottom, they're very replaceable. So uh, there's not a lot of sort of, uh, there's not a lot of humanity necessarily uh, with regard to um, you know if 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 somebody is getting too old and they can't make typewriters as fast it's like I can just gonna take them out and say you're fired I'm gonna bring in some young person who can make typewriters just as fast now right so the people become interchangeable they become replaceable Marx didn't like that he wanted sort of the, he wanted production to be more uh, humane he wanted the workers to engage in like profit sharing. Right, so if a company makes a lot of profit, it's like everybody should be uh, should um, equally get to uh, enjoy that profit. All right, um, so these are Marx, uh, these are Karl Marx, his uh, his theory for sort of rearranging uh, economic structures in society uh, to make things uh, more egalitarian. Right, so he wanted to replace capitalism with a more what's called egalitarian. Egalitarian is um, briefly just sort of like everybody has an equal say everybody has an is an equal share sort of in the company let's say right but he wanted to force this upon all companies right and this is where i start to back away a little bit i'm like mm, 
right? Because as soon as you start sort of forcing companies uh, to engage in business practices a certain way, I'm like, I don't want to force anybody to do anything, especially if you have a CEO of a company and you have workers who are voluntarily working for that company, right? So freedom of association, for instance, um, if workers get a choice to work at, you know, McDonald's or Wendy's, you know, let's say Wendy's treats your workers better. Like more people want to go to work at, or like, let's say like Chick-fil-A, like people love working at Chick-fil-A, right? Um, so there's like more people who want to work at Chick-fil-A. Uh, so there's a voluntary association between the workers of Chick-fil-A and the management at Chick-fil-A who, who hires the workers. Um, so why should I go in and like force McDonald's to operate the same way as Chick-fil-A? So I'm not a big fan of forcing companies to operate in a certain way um, with regard to workers. I think, you know, there is some like mobilization. Workers can kind of choose which companies they want to work for or not work for. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm always skeptical of, you know, sort of forcing anybody to do anything. All right. Um, you do need to know the difference between capitalism, socialism and communism. Capitalism sort of in its purest form is like the, the free trade of um, uh, of goods and services between two people, right? Now, there is, you know, people talk about like crony capitalism where like certain like people are getting like benefits from the government, like Amazon getting tax breaks. Well, that, that's not capitalism. That's like crony capitalism, right? If I'm a big business and I can influence the government to make laws for me that apply that don't apply to me and apply to other people, like that's not capitalism then, right? sort of pure free market capitalism is two individuals make a deal to trade goods and services and that's the end of the interaction, right? Um, but it's not forced. Socialism is sort of on the way to communism, all right? Um, socialism is the government means of production. So the government owns the production. Um, that there you have it. All right. So the government would own the production with regard to certain businesses. All right. There are things in like the U.S. culture that are like quasi socialist, uh, not as a pejorative, but just as a we all contribute to um, their function. Uh, we all contribute tax dollars and then the government controls them. So things like public schools, right, public libraries, the fire department. Right. Um, these are all organizations where we all put money, like we all pay for it because we are, you know, we, we, uh, we have tax dollars that go to it, but the government's in charge of the system, right? Now this gets a little bit iffy when you're talking about goods and services like, you know, farming, right? Coal mines, like, do you want the government in charge of the energy sector where we're all, you know, paying for people to, um, uh, extract coal or natural gas or oil or whatever? Um, like that gets a little bit Interesting. All right. Full on communism is the final piece of this puzzle. And what communism is, is not now the government controls the means of production and government also controls how the goods and services get divvied up between everybody. So now there's no more private property. All right. So under socialism, it's like there are going to be some things that the government controls the like the, the business like this is a government owned business and I can go in. I can go in and choose to, you know, buy certain things. Right. In communism, there's no more private property. So now the government controls the means of production and the government sort of just gives me what I need, right? I can't go in and buy two loaves of bread because the government in communism, the government says like, you only need one loaf of bread. So you don't have to buy it. Like we'll give you a loaf of bread, but that's all the bread that you get, all right? Under socialism, the government might own the bread factory, but I can go in with my own money and say, like, I want to buy five loaves of bread. And the government's like, cool, right? We own the business, but you can buy as much bread as you want. Under communism, you know, the government says, you know, each according, here we go, right? Each according to his abilities, right? Each according to his needs, which means you work to the best of your abilities, right? But you only get to take whatever it is you need to survive, right? And this isn't really good incentive because I might want to work really, really hard so I can buy five loaves of bread. I want, I might want more bread. Right. I might want a cooler car. Right. But the government's like, ah, you don't really need a nicer car. Like your car's fine. You own a, you know, your pickup truck's 11 years old and has 100,000 miles on it. Like you're And I'm like, ah, I really want a new pickup truck. They're like, you don't need one. All right. So in communism, there's a lot, there, there's not, there's, there's not private property and people can't just sort of willy nilly go out there and buy whatever it is they want. Like you only get 
what it is that you need to survive, right? So it's trying to sort of spread the resources so that, um, yeah, so everybody just kind of has only what they need and you can't buy more, all right? All right, so there you have it. Um, uh, ironically, right, this is very ironic as far as Mark's personal life. Marx was an academic um, with regard to, you know, he wrote down a lot of ideas about sort of how, you know, communism and um, he wrote about, you know, the his hatred of capitalism. But one of the ironies is like Marx's entire life was propped up by capitalism because he had this friend named Engels. So you'll read something like Mark and Engels, uh, sometimes on like the title of like uh, the Communist Manifesto, for instance. Um, and Engel's dad was this part owner in a cotton factory, so a bit large textile factory. And Engels helped to pay off Marx his debts through the textile factory profits. So Marx was not involved in the textile industry. He was not involved in the cotton mill. Um, but he was just an academic sitting at home writing like these utopian ideas down. And he was like, but I'm in a huge amount of debt. Like I got to pay my, you know, I got to pay the bar tab. I got to pay my grocery bill. And Engels was like, God, you're... All right, I'll take care of it for you. So Marx's entire life was, you know, boosted uh, by this uh, by this capitalist corporation in, the, in this cotton mill um, while he sat around all day and talked about how much he hated capitalism. All right. Um, historically, these ideas didn't really work. And you can read something like Animal Farm, which is written by George Orwell. Um, there's this famous quote near the end where it says, all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. The short version of Animal Farm is that the animals try to have a revolution. They try to have a Marxist revolution. They say, we're all going to be equal. We're going to overthrow the farmer. The farmer is this, you know, bourgeoisie, you know, evil, nasty capitalist. And they overthrow the farmer. But now all the animals are there and they're trying to create this sort of like, you know, communist utopia. Uh, and as they start to work it out, what they realize is that these two pigs start to kind of, they're like, well, we're going to be upper management. So you know, these, these pigs kind of, they, they take over and they sort of recreate this hierarchy system again, right? And they say, well, we're all equal on the farm, but we as the pigs, we should get a little bit more because we're trying to like take care of all of you. It's really hard to manage. This is the same thing that happened in the USSR, right? So former Soviet Union, right? They tried to create this utopia vision. They were working towards sort of like pure communism, but as it, you know, it, it led to a lot of corruption as you saw with like Stalin, Right. So as soon as somebody gets in charge and they're like, we need somebody to, you know, uh, we need somebody to be in charge of all the government ran businesses and we need somebody to sort of divvy up all the goods and services to people. Those people would start to say like, well, OK, I got all the bread. Now, every family in the USSR gets a loaf of bread, but I'm going to take two for my family. Right. OK, everybody in the USSR gets a car. Mm, I'm going to put myself at the front of the line and make sure that I get the first car off the lot. Right. That's what you start to see happen. That's that's what George Orwell's sort of laying out here in Animal Farm is it becomes corrupted very quickly because no longer can people freely go and purchase the car they want. The only way that you can get the car you want is if you are the person in the position of power who divides up all the cars or divides up all the bread or divides up all the milk and eggs. Right. Um, there's no more free market where it's like, oh, I want milk. I just go to the store and I buy milk. It's, I want milk, and they're like, you got to wait your turn in line. You don't need milk yet. But somebody who's in charge of divvying out the milk's like, well, it's not my turn in line yet, but I'm just going to take the milk. And I'm going to take a couple extra bottles from my friends because I like them. All right. That's what happens in sort of these, you know, quasi utopian, you know, commun like trying to be communist uh, states of affairs. The people at the top who are in charge of divvying things out, they just, they get really corrupted. All right. Um, and so you have this huge stratification between people at the top, right? The, the oligarchs is what they're known as um, in the Soviet Union. Super, super, super wealthy people who seem to have all these resources. And then everybody at the bottom is like, hey, I thought we were supposed to all be equal. And they're like, we are supposed to be equal, but some animals are more equal than others. Us at the top, we have such an important job that we're going to go live in these like castles and these mansions and stuff. Uh, because our job is so hard to take care of everybody, right? Um, that's what happens in the USSR. That's what George Orwell talks about uh, in the book Animal Farm. All right. The limitations of com or excuse me, of Marxism is that not everything is always about power. So it, Marxism makes everything about power, uh, but there are a lot of things in life that aren't about power, right? You have friendships. So you, like, how do you divvy up your friendships based on power? Um, you know, sometimes like you know just. Uh, 
if you think about, uh, yeah, what you consume isn't always necessarily about issues of power. Sometimes what you can, um, this, you know, the text that you consume, the books you, the movies you watch, right? It's not always about power, right? And it only works if everyone stays in their lane. And what I mean by this, I go into more in depth in a different class on this idea. It only works like if it's everyone according to his abilities, let's say that I'm super, super good at like doing factory work and making typewriters. And let's say I do that for 10 years and I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go try farming. But the government's like, no, everyone's got to do their job because like, Josh, you're really good at farming. And the only way that we can keep this society moving forward is if Josh continues to be a farmer or excuse me, Josh continues to work in a factory. And I'm like, I don't want to work in a factory anymore. Right. I want to go do something else. It's hard for people. It's hard to hold a society together if people are like jumping around to different jobs, if people have different interests, because everyone has to work according to his abilities. And I might say, but I want to save up money and I don't want to work today. Right. And they're like, but you have to, because if Josh doesn't work, then we don't have enough milk to hand out to everybody. All right. Um, so it only works if everybody stays in their lane. And there's plenty of people who want to try lots of different things. Like some people just don't want to. If I'm a really good. Yeah. If I'm a really good farmer and they're like, Josh, keep farming. I'm like, I don't want to farm anymore. But they're like, Josh, you're really good at it. And if you're not upholding your end of your abilities, then the whole society is going to collapse because we won't have enough food because we need your you know, share of food to go into the big pot of food that we can divvy up to everybody. All right. So it doesn't work if people get out of their lanes. This goes back to the first slide when I talk about sort of like the text that's being produced. Right. If I say, hey, I have some questions about the government. Like, I think they're doing some bad things. I want to write that in a book. The government's going to take my book and say, don't write that book. They're going to censor it. Right. Because. It, these systems only work if everybody is on the same page, right? And if we're being honest with ourselves, you know, we have a country, you know, the United States of 300 million people. How many, how many of these 300 million people are on the same page about anything ever? And it's like, it doesn't happen, right? Human nature is messy. It's complex, right? People want to jump around to different jobs. People want to have different opinions. You're not allowed to do that if everyone has to be on the same page in order to make a, make a society that works like a machine right? Runs like clockwork. That sort of utopia. It's like everybody went to work today. Everybody ate today, right? Everybody goes to bed. If you're just trying to have this like clockwork thing, it's like, look, like life is a lot more is about a lot more than just sort of like doing your job, going home, eating and surviving. It's like people just kind of, you know, people kind of go off in different directions and they have to be free to do that. And if you're not free to do that, um, yeah, you're going to be, you know, shoveled up into the gulags. Okay, final slide here. Um, this is important. So now Marxism is about classism, right? It's about the class, right? You have people in the upper class, you have people in the lower class. The people in the upper class create stories and narratives that they put out in society that makes all of us, you know, comfortable on the, on the bottom rung of the ladder. Neo-Marxist, right? What neo-Marxist theories are saying is that Marxist principles can be applied to other systems. So neo means new. So the new Marxist theories, right? Mostly this is critical theory, which is in one of those videos uh, that I have posted. So make sure you watch them, right? So what critical theory does is it applies Marxist principles with regard to issues of like privilege and oppression to other groups outside of class systems, right? So they might say, you know, so race, sexuality, age, gender are the big ones. Um, so something with regard to race, for instance, right? If a, if, a, if a person who is engaged in theories about issues of race is a neo-Marxist, what they look at is what cultural stories are being told to keep, if, you know, to be blunt about it, white people at the top and people of color at the bottom, right? So are there certain, are there movies, are there texts, are there books, are there um, power systems with regard to corporations, right? So when you, when you hear the term like systemic racism, which you probably heard like in, for you know the last year or so, like on social media or the news or whatever, this is what people are talking about, right? There's this sort of system in place that keeps some people at the top and some people at the bottom, right? With regard to, right? It could be issues of race, sexuality, right? There are certain stories that people at the top tell with regard to issues of sexuality to keep some things normal right, and acceptable and some things marginalized and oppressed, right? Um, feminist, uh, feminist theory is a neo-Marxist theory specifically around issues of gender, right? Early feminists from like the 60s and set, well, not early feminists, but feminists from second wave feminism in the 60s and 70s when it started getting into academia, uh, were looking specifically at what text of culture sort of 
continue to hold men at the top and continue to marginalize women at the bottom, right? That's what neo-Marxist theory is to do, right? And again, it always looks at issues of power and hierarchy. Now, again, the problem with this, one of the limitations is, you know, if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And what I mean by this is, if you go around society and you're always looking at like, how is society divided up by power, then you're gonna just see power everywhere. And you're not gonna, like sometimes power isn't, like power doesn't always, you know, um, isn't always the driving factor for some people's interactions, right? The other problem with this is like, if we're just gonna play a power game, um, if, if, if the whole justification for playing the power game or engaging in this sort of uh, theory about power, well, if you're going to play a power game with regard to issues of like race or gender, why can't I play a power game with regard to race and gender? If we're just going to sit here and have a power fight over who's oppressed and who's privileged and who's marginalized, or whatever, it's like now all of a sudden you're going to just bring in everybody and everybody's going to, you know, only identify with their group identity um, with regard to issues of like race, gender, sexuality, et cetera. And then it just becomes this big power struggle for like who wins. And I'm like, that's a horrible way to engage with anybody, right? Like, are you, do you always want to be treated as a part of your group? It's like, no, right? I don't want to sit around and just identify with whatever group identities I have, right? And you probably don't either, right? Um, let's get through this section right here, right? So this has the same irony of Marx, right? So again, Marx was a huge critic of capitalism, but his entire lifestyle was upheld by this capitalist uh, system through his friend Engels. So there's always this question I have for people who are sort of these revolutionary Marxists, you know, in reality, is I want to ask them, like, do you really hate the idea of power and money or do you just hate the fact that you don't have it, right? And if you're a person who's like, I'm a true Marxist revolutionary and you do want an egalitarian system, um, then great. But what I found is that most people who claim Marxism as their driving ideology, what they really want is they just they just want themselves to have the power as opposed to the people who are currently in power, right? It's they want to go around and they're like, you know, I'm a Marxist, I'm a revolutionary. Okay, give me the power now. Like if you give me the power, I'm the one who can rearrange the system. It's like, okay, you're not really a Marxist revolutionary, right? A true Marxist uh, revolutionary would say, we want to eliminate all issues of power and money and I'm gonna do it in a way where at the end of this, I'm not even gonna have power and money. But what you find is like, you know, something like Cuba, for instance, Fidel Castro is like, I'm a Marxist revolutionary. Fidel Castro gets into power and he's like, yeah, I just wanted power, right? I kind of like it here. And then he ends up being a dictator of Cuba for like 60 years, all right? So that's always a question I have for people. It's like, are you really upset? Like, do you really want this sort of more egalitarian, equal society where you yourself don't even get to have a lot. You don't. You you get to have no power, and you don't get to have money, um, because nobody has any money or power, right? We're all sort of equal here. Or do you just are you are you just upset that you're not the one in charge? And if you go around and you're like, you know, I need to be in charge of Amazon, or I need to be in charge of the uh, uh, of of um, of Walmart, or I need to be in charge of the media, then you're not really a Marxist revolutionary. You're just upset that you don't have the you know you don't have the role that somebody else has. And if we're doing that, then all of a sudden, again, it just becomes this power grab of, you know, the people at the top are going to hold on to their power. The people at the bottom are trying to get power. And now it's like, okay, we're all playing this power game now. All right. Um, and again, like, should you always be a, treated as a part of your group, right? Whatever group you are, right? Whether or not it's based on your class, race, gender, sexuality, et cetera. And then you have to ask this question, okay, like which group, right? So there are groups, right? So if you go around and say, you know, I'm oppressed because of, uh, the class status in which I grew up in, which I think I could claim, like I'm lower working class background, right? My family did like blue collar construction work. So I could probably pl claim like, oh, I'm, I'm oppressed because I come from a working class background. But it's like, okay, but I'm white and I'm male, right? And you're like, okay. So if I always want to be treated as a part of a group, it's like, which one of these do I want to claim with regard to, you know, the power that I have in a situation, right? And the truth of the matter is like there are some things that you do have you know quote unquote privilege with regard to and there's other things in which you might feel that you have been oppressed in some way or you've been marginalized in some way so it's like which one are you going to choose with regard to this power game right and most people are just going to say like i'm going to choose the one that like benefits me with regard to sort of creating a, a you know a revolution but they're going to be completely you're going to have this huge blind spot with regard to all the ways in which you actually have um, privilege, like you're going to be completely, you have this blind spot with regard to all the ways in which, you know, 
your identity, for instance, uh, gives you, you know, benefits that doesn't give other people, right? Um, so an example of this with regard to like huge privilege status, uh, especially for, you know, college age revolutionaries out there um, in the United States, right? So I'll be specific here with the United States. It's if you are a college student in the United States, I hate to break this to you, but you are in the 1% based on world economic standards, right? Now you might say like, but I don't have any money in my wallet. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is social capital, right? If you are a college student in the United States of America, you have more access to lots of things than 99% of the world's population, right? You have more access to um, knowledge, which then gives you networking, which then gives you a, a, a job, which then can give you a, a house and a food, and you can live comfortably, all right? So if you want to go around and say, like, we, you know, down with the capitalists, like, I'm, I hate to tell you this, but, like, if you're a college student right now in the United States, you are in the top 1% of the entire world's population with regard to access to resources, all right? Most of the world lives on less than, the the, the, the number, if we get specific about it, is about $34,000 a year, right? Now you might say, but I'm not making $34,000 a year, but you're getting that social capital, that, that certificate of achievement that says, I have a college degree. When you graduate college, you're going to find a job where it's, the starting salary is probably closer to $50,000 a year as opposed to $34,000 a year. But even if you go and you just make $34,000 a year out of college, it's like you are in the top 1% of wage earners around the world. All right. So if you want to engage in this, then you better be willing to make a lot of sacrifices. Um, most people just sort of like look up the economic ladder and most people don't realize how extremely privileged they are. Uh, when it comes to access to resources and capital and social capital, et cetera. All right. So that's always, um, it's always some of the limitations of this, right? Like, do you really hate power and money or did you just hate the fact that you don't have it? Um, and if you say like, no, like I, like I want to be the one making a hundred thousand dollar salary, you know, being the, you know, upper management of some big corporation. And it's like, okay, then you're not, you, then you have no issue with power. You just, you just want it for yourself as opposed to the person who currently is in that position. All right. Um, and so that's always a limitation of Marxism, right? The pigs in Animal Farm, they weren't really upset that, you know, that things were unequal on the farm. They were just upset that the farmer was in charge and not them. Right. And that's usually how Marxism devolves. It's a utopian dreamscape. Um, that in practicality doesn't work, hasn't worked. Um, it might work on a very, very small scale of a few thousand people, right? Living in some sort of like commune together. But on a large scale, what always ends up happening is that people rise to the top and then once they're at the top, they're like, I kind of like my position at the top, right? And I want to be in charge of sort of divvying out the resources. Um, and so you really don't want pure egalitarianism. What you want is to be, you know, in a better, powerful position. All right. Okay. That's Marxism. Um, I know it was slanted, but you can watch those other two videos. You can find plenty of videos on YouTube that are less biased in my presentation. Um, but it, as far as our conversation is concerned and communication, Marxism is useful. I do think it's useful as a theory to look at cultural text. How do text uphold systems of power? How do texts challenge systems of power? How do they break down hierarchies um, as some sort of like practical economic model for, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, some sort of geopolitical, you know, nation state. I think it's awful and horrible and ends to very, very, very bad results. All right. Um, but as far as looking at something like, you know, studying a Bernie Sanders speech, I think like looking at Marxism would be useful uh, because of all the ways that Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, uh, talks about inequality. Um, if you're looking at something like uh, the, the first slide with regard to like Jay-Z and the Occupy Wall Street stuff and Colin Kaepernick and Nike, I think it's useful to look at like how do corporations manipulate us in order to, you know, get more money out of us as far as our, con our consumer spending habits. I think it's extremely appropriate and extremely useful, all right, as far as like who controls the narrative and what are they really trying to do here? It's like, oh, they're trying to make profit. Okay, let's, let's look at how they're trying to make profit. Out, uh, with regard to trying to look like they're sort of a part of the cause, down for the struggle. Uh, but really, they're just, you know, putting out a narrative that uh, is going to 
put more money into their into their profit margins that that quarter. All right. Okay. Uh, that's all I got for uh, Marxism. Watch those couple of videos. I'll see you all next time.